Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the end of the first day of the inaugural Pi Bay Conference. Um, I'm really glad to be here. Um, you know, I've had a chance to speak uh, about Bokeh mostly um, at some conferences that are a bit more narrower focused, things like SciPy and PyData. Um, so I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be here and sort of speak about Bokeh to a little bit of a more general and broad audience. Um, first off, just curious, um, so I can calibrate my own sort of thoughts and, and how I speak today. Who's uh, used Bokeh or had a chance to look at it? OK, about half maybe, a little bit less. So it's probably good then to speak a little bit about what Bokeh is. So Bokeh is a, a platform for visualization. Um, it's really for being able to create interactive visualizations with uh, things like widgets, tools, uh, dynamic selections that you can use on the, the plots and the visualizations to be able to create very versatile graphics as well. There are a lot of interesting use cases that aren't necessarily uh, amenable to fitting into sort of standard plots, and so we want to be able to support these very versatile use cases as well. We also want to handle things like streaming or dynamic or possibly large data, and so we'll talk about some things that are afforded by Bokeh for that. Um, and this all, all targets modern browsers. Uh, and it, there's a server component to Bokeh that's also part of the, the core library, um, which is on GitHub, BSD licensed. Uh, but you can create very dynamic visualizations with or without the server, and we'll see some examples of that as well. Uh, and the last thing, though, is really for the most part, there's no JavaScript. I'll repeat that. Um, no, no JavaScript. Uh, I know I don't like writing JavaScript. I actually end up writing a lot of it these days, so hopefully you don't have to. Uh, but you know, that's sort of the main point is we wanted to enable people to do more with less um, with Bokeh and sort of be able to get started and get running very easily. So I don't usually speak much about uh, myself, usually at, at talks or, or, or things, but I hope you'll indulge me a little bit. I've been sort of ruminating a bit about the history of Bokeh and leading up to it and my own experiences leading up to it, just because we're sort of closing in on trying to have a 1.0 release uh, sort of draw a line in the ground for sort of stability uh, in not too many months. And so it got me thinking about a few things. So I thought I'd just share some of my own experiences, hopefully very quickly. Um, thinking all the way back, I, I was kind of wondering what made me get interested in, in sort of visualization. And I don't know, who remembers Logo? Show of hands, right? Um, you know, I loved it. Uh, I was very fortunate uh, where I grew up, the public library had a very innovative program that actually let you check out a Tandy TRS-80 computer for two weeks. You could take it back to your house and hook it up to your television with an RF modulator and it had all kinds of cartridges for applications and one of them had a little turtle on it and you could plug it in the back of your, your TRS-80 and you could start programming away. And what really struck me is the fact that you could really do a lot of sophisticated things without much code at all. A few simple statements would just sort of take off and go. And so I really, you know, I think that idea struck with me and has stayed with me for many years. Um, note to self, I think I need to make a turtle graphics bokeh app. Uh, if I had thought of this before this morning, might have had one for you to try out today. Um, so what else? Uh, the next thing I, sort of I encountered that made an impression on me was Fractant. Anyone remember Fractant, a little program? So it was this fantastic DOS program for making fractals. And what you could do is you could zoom in at any point and just you know, keep sort of seeing the finer and finer detail of these fractal expressions. Um, and you could just sort of spend hours doing it. And you could spend hours doing it because it got progressively longer and longer <laughs> to zoom in. As you zoomed in one level, it took a few seconds and then a few more seconds for the next level, and it just kept getting longer and longer. But what really struck me then was this idea to be able to sort of interact with you know, visual graphics and be able to sort of see different layers of detail across different scales. I thought that was really sort of fantastic, and that stuck with me as well. Um, the next thing that sort of came across me was many years later uh, when I was working, um, this is late 90s, so I guess around Python sort of 1.4 days, uh, someone had made a little module that you could use with Mod Python and Pill to create bar charts, I think, and, and maybe line graphs, very simple things by any standards, but on the fly, right? Data coming in, the server could read data, could read log files, you could hit a request, and you could get a chart immediately generated from that data on demand. And so that to me at the time was really, really impressive. And that's also struck with me as sort of, you know, being able to sort of present things visually uh, on the web is a natural medium for that, and how can we sort of do that with increasing sophistication? Uh, the next thing, uh, my first real encounter with open source contributions, you know, I've been using open source for a long time at that point, but my first open source contribution was VTK. And if you're not familiar with VTK, it's a very large C++ library for 3D visualization. Uh, it's, it started in the late 90s. And, you know, I, I sort of what really struck me about it then is one that it's the first instance I'd ever seen of a really, really thorough and comprehensive testing you know, infrastructure. They had this amazing dashboard where they tested VTK across, you know, 20 or 30 platforms. It was automated. It happened every day. And I had never seen anything like that coming out of school uh, in the mid-90s. I just, you know, that was completely new to me. I thought, that's amazing. That's how you really have to do it. Um, and so that sort of stuck with me as well. But also, I was just struck by the ability to be able to contribute, the opportunity to be able to add back or contribute back, I thought was a really fantastic thing. 
A little bit later on, some more years, my next sort of more in-depth foray into open source contributions was a library called Chaco I worked on with uh, Peter Wang, who's one of the co-founders at Continuum, uh, at a previous uh, place that we worked. And so this was a library for interactive rich client applications. And so this is something I wrote way back then. Just really loved it at the time. It was great. It had this sort of you know, 3D function explorer where you could hover over sort of the, the contour map of that function. And you know, wherever the crosshairs were, the, the plots on the side would update. And you know, it was just, oh, it's great. I loved it. <laughs> but um, you know, the thing about Chaco is that I learned a couple of lessons from this as well, which is it's a bit fiddly. It's a little bit hard to use. Right? If you're working developing full-scale applications, this was maybe OK. It was sort of a developer's toolkit. But it wasn't something you could use quickly, uh, not something that's sort of very, you know, in today's parlance, data science-y, right? Because it just took a lot of work and a lot of effort to get things out of it. You could get really cool things out of it, but um, you had to work at it. Um, the other thing that I learned about this is sort of more about the open source side, which is that um, you can't just toss a library over the fence you know, onto, well, now GitHub or, or back then, uh, I'm not sure where it was hosted, uh, but an expected community to just grow up out of nothing. It takes a lot of effort to really nurture and grow a community uh, around an open source project. And ultimately, that's what it takes for a project to survive and to, to flourish. I mean, if you want to have a project that's going to exist in 15 or 20 years, like BTK, for instance, um, or others, uh, you've got to develop a community around it that cares about that project and can help eventually shoulder some of the burden for maintaining it and keeping it relevant and, and functional. Um, next thing I sort of learned was uh, Conda. Just out of curiosity, who, who uses Conda? OK, that's actually really cool. So I was one of the original people that worked on Conda uh, way back when. And you know, this sort of harkens back to some of the things that Raymond said this morning about you know, when you don't have any users, <laughs> it's great. You can do whatever you want. You can change things. You can break things. It doesn't really matter. But eventually, you know, if you're fortunate enough to, to sort of garner users, they start to care about things and care about things not breaking. And you, know, you start getting more and more downloads and more and more use. And all of a sudden, you have to be very careful about you know, backwards compatibility. And so this was sort of another important lesson to learn going through developing uh, Conda. I don't really work on Conda anymore. I pretty much spent all of my time on Bokeh, which we'll talk about the rest of the talk. But Bokeh sort of encapsulates all of these lessons for me. So it's really been a, actually a long time coming. And when I thought about it, it was kind of amazing. I hadn't really put all of these sort of threads together. But when I did, I thought it was pretty, pretty interesting. So anyway, OK, so welcome to Bokeh. So I guess, like I said, about half of the folks here have seen uh, Bokeh. And, and we'll talk about a little bit more what we can do. I'm really going to talk today about some of the newer features in Bokeh, some of the newer things that are coming in Bokeh, to kind of introduce or reintroduce uh, everyone to Bokeh. So first, just to sort of give some context for that you know, development, Bokeh has been under really active development for a couple of years now. And the pace is actually accelerating. This was from, I think, SciPy 2014. It had just released uh, 0.5 in a very dramatic fashion. We released 0.5 the day of SciPy. It was, it was great fun. Um, but you know, just as of yesterday, sort of, there's been a lot of you know, acceleration. We've gone from a few thousand sort of Conda installs a month to 60,000, which is, um, to me, humbling is the only word I can really think of um, that so many people are interested in and, and wanting to use Bokeh. Um, but of course, all of this effort and all of this development takes a great team of people. Not everyone on this you know, page here, uh, sort of core developers, is currently working on Bokeh. People sort of come in and out and, and work on Bokeh. But I want to make sure to call out individuals. I actually read a really interesting article recently about uh, giving talks about open source projects where they were you know, really advocating for trying to give individual credit to individual contributors and not just saying, we did this or we did that. And I think it actually is, it really ushers home a, a good point. Um, all the work that was done is done by incredible individuals. Um, just to call out a few, the amazing, inimitable Sarah Bird, uh, who's done so much work on layout. It probably makes Bokeh look better than anyone, anyone else. We've got Havoc Pennington, you might know from GTK and Gnome, who worked on the second generation Bokeh server, made it really amazing. Uh, we have a lot of folks. Uh, you know, Fabio worked on charts. Peter, of course, our co-founder, sort of helped uh, get Bokeh started. We don't let him push code anymore because it breaks the repository. But uh, <laughs> you know, anyway, lots of folks have contributed. But in addition to these sort of core contributors, what really excites me, what really is amazing to me, is you know the fact that other people now are starting to make more and more contributions. One of the things that I've heard recently a lot is, um, or at least a few times, <laughs> hopefully more and more, is statements like. Uh, I just made my first pull request to an open source project, and it was to Bokeh. And I, that, to me, is an amazing, um, you know, just an amazing thing to hear. I, we try to be a very welcoming project. We try to encourage people to come and contribute at a variety of different levels. And so that's a validation of that. But it's also very, again, humbling that people would take and spend the time to, to do that. So we're always very excited. Uh, just calling out a few special thanks for a bunch of recent contributors that have made some really significant contributions to, to Bokeh. 
Uh, we have a pretty active uh, community on a variety of forums as well. So we, of course, Stack Overflow, we try to monitor. Uh, the discussion group, I think, is up to 600 users now, uh, maybe 650. And of course, we have a Gitter channel that's growing as well. So a lot of opportunity to interact with both the core devs and with a growing base of users who can answer questions as well. So anyway, that's sort of setting the stage for uh, the talk, uh, which is really that I just want to talk about, um, you know, like I said, what sort of new sort of going on with Bokeh today. Uh, for folks that aren't familiar with Bokeh, this will be a nice, hopeful, hopeful introduction to some of the you know, more useful or better features. And for folks that are familiar, maybe it's a reintroduction. Uh, another thing that I've heard uh, quite a bit, not quite a bit, but I've heard sometimes in the last uh, few weeks is people saying, oh yeah, I, I tried Bokeh you know, a year ago or two years ago, and um, Bokeh is light years ahead of where it was uh, even a year ago, certainly two years ago. So hopefully this will give some nice context for what is possible with Bokeh today. OK, so the first thing is actually not about Python, uh, even though obviously we're at a Python conference. Uh, but you know, the architecture of Bokeh is this. So there's actually two libraries. There's uh, Bokeh.js, which is this client JavaScript library. It actually does all the rendering, handles all the events in the browser. Uh, it natively uses HTML5 Canvas. There's an optional uh, WebGL backend that supports uh, some of the functionality as well. Uh, and the interface to it, the standard interface, is this declarative JSON interface. Um, and so anything that can generate the right JSON can actually drive Bokeh plots in the browser. And so Continuum, we're really heavily invested in you know, Python by and large. And so we've spent a lot of effort developing Python bindings for Bokeh. So there's basically a Python library that can generate the right JSON that can drive these Bokeh applications and documents in the browser. But you know, it'd be nice to have maybe a programmatic you know, interface to make Bokeh.js sort of a JavaScript library in its own right. We haven't really had a chance to sort of push or advocate for that. But now we'd like to do that. And so just recently, we added a new uh, actual functional API. Uh, it's actually written in TypeScript. Uh, and there's sort of a couple of different levels. If you're familiar with Bokeh, there's a very low level Bokeh.models sort of building block API. There's sort of a middle layer uh, Bokeh.plotting, which is sort of at the same verbosity as um, you know, Matplotlib or MATLAB or one of, you know, one of those. And then there's a very level, high level Bokeh.charts interface. So uh, basically, there's a one-to-one -one port of bokeh.models and a one-to-one -one port of bokeh.plotting. Um, you know, you can see over here, if you were to look at the Python code for a chart sort of like this, this color scatter plot, it would actually look fairly similar uh, to what is here. Um, a little bit of code, maybe not a ton of code. But there's also um, a high-level charts interface that has been added as well. And so this is actually much more concise and lets you do quite a bit more with quite a bit less code, sort of the idea. So in this case, you know, we have a, basically a one-liner for every one of those donut charts, for every one of those bar charts is a one-liner. And all the charts come you know, pre-made with sort of highlighting over the different uh, glyphs, or in some cases, a hover tool. Uh, so all of that's just sort of baked in and ready to go. So there's only a couple of chart types in the high-level sort of bokeh.charts JavaScript API. But we do plan to add more. And if you have experience uh, you know, and interest, we'd love to have people come add even more types to this. This is an area where I think folks who do have some JavaScript experience uh, could be a real help and to, and to plug in. And it's sort of a self-contained. Uh, my experience with um, you know, con contributions from new contributors is that sort of it's easier, definitely, obviously, to get, to get started with a, a task or a, a problem that's a bit more self-contained. And so I'm always trying to call out you know, where are areas that are very, you know, not necessarily easy or not necessarily trivial, but sort of self-contained conceptually so that it's easier for people to get started and uh, it's easier for us to answer questions about. So anyway, that's sort of the first thing that I wanted to mention was this, this actual, not Python thing, but JavaScript thing. OK, what else is new? So something else that's new uh, is much improved layout. So as Sarah Bird would call it, uh, webby and responsive, I think, is the terminology he <laughs> prefers to use. So, you know, as I said, Bokeh is this platform for creating these visualizations that have, you know, all kinds of different uh, plots and all kinds of different widgets, and you can use the widgets to interact uh, either with the server or with custom JS callbacks and all kinds of things. For a while, there weren't very good layout options. Things weren't looking good. Sarah is really concerned with, uh, you know, the appearance of things and making things look really, you know, better. And there's still ongoing work here to do to uh, keep working on our layout to keep working on some of the responsive functionality, to keep making things look better. But she's done a tremendous job uh, over the last several months uh, to make that much, much better. So this is just an example that's in our repo. All the examples I'm going to show, by the way, are in the GitHub repo. You can go run them. Uh, I'll be running some of them a little bit later. We'll do some demos. But uh, just so you know, they're all available you know, on GitHub as part of the project. So that was a big chunk. That actually started in Bokeh 0.12. So that was sort of the big. The big push for 0.12 was this big refactor to cover different and, and new layout styles and layout options. OK. Uh, sorry. So one of the main things we wanted to enable with Bokeh uh, is to let people write basically web apps for data science or web apps for science or 
uh, you know, web apps of a lot of kinds that connect the, a lot of people to connect the Python data science stack to these web apps very easily, right? So, you know, we have people using uh, NumPy and Pandas and PyTables and, uh, you know, scikit-learn and scikit-image, and we want to be able to write apps, you know, that immediately drive results, visual results in front of people, uh, both plots, but also, you know, maybe you've got parameters that you want to enable tweaking through widgets, and so all those things are what we want to enable. We want to make that very easy, just dead simple to, to write. So let's take a look. Well, so, so what does that mean? The reason for that is so that you can concentrate on what you're doing, right? So that, you know, you can just stay in Python, you know, by and large, almost completely. You don't have to worry about sort of the web app coding part. You don't have to worry typically about the HTML, CSS, unless you want to. Uh, you can just stay in pure Python where you're comfortable, where you're using, you know, NumPy, where you're using Pandas, all of these familiar tools. Um, and the way to write these apps is just to write simple scripts. There's not any sort of special class hierarchies uh, or frameworks that you have to plug into or buy into or learn. Um, I'll show an example here in a minute, just some simple, very simple scripts. Um, and these are really useful for uh, exploratory type work, exploratory data analysis. You can run them locally on your own machine. You can send them to someone else, and they can run them locally on their own machine. Uh, but you can also publish and share them if you want. Uh, you know, there's a lot of documentation about how you might stand up uh, a Bokeh server application on a public site, for instance, or how you might scale it out. Um, the server itself is very horizontally scalable. Uh, if you need more capacity, for instance, you can just run more of them. And I'll, I'll show off the site that we deploy our uh, examples in a minute. Uh, and that actually, that deployment is completely documented. You could re use it as a, a template for, for standing up a similar deployment. Okay. Uh, but the main thing that it does, the main thing the Bokeh server does, which is what hosts these applications, uh, is to automatically synchronize the Python state and the browser state. So we have this notion of uh, models. We call them models. They're basically just objects that represent things in your, doc your visualization, right? So you might have a plot or glyphs that render different shapes or tools or you know, grids and axes. Uh, we also have models for widgets. And so these are just Python objects, but they're corresponding uh, sort of a one-to-one -one correspondence with the objects on the JavaScript side. Uh, and the Bokeh server is able to mirror those and keep those in sync. And so this bidirectional communication, this bidirectional synchronization is really the key to everything. Uh, because if someone makes a selection on a scatter plot in, you know, on, the, on the browser in their client, uh, that selection can be communicated back to the Python code. The Python code can do something. It can run a regression. It can run some sort of statistical average over that collection of points that were selected. Um, it can use this information that it computed to change the state of the data source to change the state of an axis or a title. Uh, and that change is automatically mirrored back to the plot, and the plot updates accordingly. And so this sort of feedback loop is really what enables lots of really powerful things. And again, we'll see some examples here in just a bit. Uh, and like I said, the main idea is that we want to be able to connect the full PyData stack, all the amazing tools that have come out in the last you know, five to 10 years uh, to interactive web apps. And, and I, I, they're just to reiterate, there's an amazing stack of PyData tools. If you're following any of sort of the, you know, the data science side of Python, it's, it's pretty incredible. Um, you know, obviously, we started with things like you know, NumPy and the precursors you know, before that, like NumArray um, and Numeric. But it you know, started with NumPy and then SciPy and Pandas, and it's just sort of this growing snowball of tools. And now we have things like Numba and PyTables. Um, and you know, all of these things are really just incredible. And, and the fact that they're available to all of us, I think, is a, a wonderful thing. OK. So actually, I wanted to go jump down to show off a couple of examples. So go over here to the terminal. And I am just going to run a couple here. So I'm going to run a very simple one first. And actually, these are all hosted. Uh, and I'll show you where they are in just a bit. But let's go ahead and run one. Uh, I'm going to run this sliders app, so sliders.py. And then we'll take a look at the code here in a second. So that's great. It gives me a nice plot visualization. It's got a sine wave. I've got these sliders here that can control all of the different parameters, the, you know, the offset, the amplitude, the phase, the frequency. All of those are modifiable. I can say my sine wave for pi bay. I spelled pi bay. Let's fix that better. Right, and all of that immediately updates it. Again, that's that two-way communication. As I change things on the front end, that changes the state of the JavaScript objects. Those get mirrored into Python. Python can react to that. We can define callbacks that respond to these changes that further update the Python objects, which then causes the front end to update as well. And so all of that works. Of course, it's a standard bokeh plot. has all the standard tools you might expect for resetting or you know, wheel zoom, all the standard sort of plot tools that you might want are all there. Uh, save tool if we want to generate a PNG, uh, that sort of thing. So what does the code for that look like? Well, let's actually see how conference Wi-Fi does today. Really great. So these are all hosted, by the way, on demo.bokehplots.com. Uh, not all of them. A lot of the examples so far are hosted on demo.bokehplots.com. And so you can go there and run the sliders example. We can actually click here and see the code as well. Uh, and it's not much, right? So what does it look like? Let's make my font a bit bigger. So there's some imports. 
that's great. Um, there is some few lines of NumPy code where I you know, create my actual uh, data. There's two lines to generate the plot and the line. Uh, there's one line each for all of those widgets, right? For every slider, we just create a slider with uh, all the things we might want to put in it. Uh, and then we define some callbacks. Whenever the, uh, whenever the text, slider or text, uh, text box change, uh, we update that title property in the plot. Whenever the, any of the sliders change, we go ahead and recompute a new value for the Y values, and we set that on our data source, uh, and that causes the plot to respond visually. Uh, finally, there's a couple of lines of you know, boilerplate here. We set up a layout, a widget box, and we add the, the plot and the widget box to our document, uh, and that's it. So this is the entire thing. That's what I ran Bokeh Serve on. Again, no special classes, no special uh, you know, sort of frameworks you have to build into. It's just a really dead simple Python script, right? Um, it's not too far different from what you would write, you know, if you were just writing a, an app to deal with sort of, you know, these sort of functions. So that's one example. Let's take a look at maybe a couple more right quick. Um, another one that's, that's kind of nice is this uh, Cross Filter Explorer. So this is using the, uh, we call it Auto MPG, but I think uh, NT Cars is another name for this data set. So it's just a lot of information about a different car models, and so you can create a nice scatter plot. We have some drop downs here that let us display, you know, maybe we want to color to shade the, the points by the horsepower. Maybe we want to turn it into a bubble chart by setting the size to be equal to the weight. So all those things, again, are very straightforward to do. And again, we could, we could go up here. We could look for the code for that. Um, which one next? Last one maybe here. Here's a reproduction, actually. If you're drawing comparisons to R Shiny, <laughs> that's sort of maybe natural. Um, people have been asking, where is Shiny for Python for a long time? I hope we're providing something that might you know, be at least some kind of an answer to that question. Um, here's a reproduction just to sort of make a really nice direct comparison of the, uh, the Movie Explorer application. And this just has a lot of IMDB data. And again, you can sort of uh, move the slider and see how things work. We can filter by the dollars at the box office or filter by genre and all of that updates. And so you could imagine um, you know, just being able to write these kind of applications that have all of these kind of widgets that are driven by, again, not a ton of code. We can take a look at the code for this one right quick and then probably go ahead and move on. Oh, sorry, that's the wrong the wrong one. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Try that again. So let's take a look at source code for movies. There we go. So again, this is actually a, uh, a directory style. So the, the app before I ran was a single script. It's possible also to have a directory with a main.py. Uh, and if, in that case, you can have additional resources. So the actual data, you know, the genres file is there. The query.sql, which is the actual IMDB data, is in that directory. Uh, we actually added something to the example, which was we colored all of the, uh, the Razzies a nice little purple color so we could sort of see, you know, sometimes there are movies that make a lot of money that are also Razzies. But anyway, so all of this stuff can go there, things like a README um, and all this nice stuff. So anyway, the, the code, if we go to the main.py, uh, we can take a look. It's a pretty short script, right? The actual, most of the work here is the data cleanup that you'd be doing anyway because you're dealing with data. Um, and data is messy. Uh, the actual code for the app is, again, you know, there's sort of a, a line each for all of the, the widgets. There's you know, a hover tool we added. Uh, and then there's sort of a callback that happens when we select things. So fairly straightforward, hopefully. OK, so that's a couple of examples of some fairly simple uh, Bokeh applications. Uh, went back. So some things that are fairly new uh, are some streaming interfaces, right? So I mentioned that whenever you make changes on the Python side, they're automatically reflected. So it's always the case that you could update the plot by updating all of the data for the plot. But there are a couple of you know, particular cases that can be optimized much further than that, right? If you have streaming data, by which I mean there's new data is appended to the very end of your, your data columns, uh, and you want to you know, update the plot, it's, it's kind of inefficient to send all the data. We just need to send the new points and put them at the very end. And so there's a dot .stream method on our, our column data sources that can be used to do that. Um, and there's also even newer, there's a dot .patch. So if you need sort of random access to change just a couple of points, maybe you have some data columns that have you know, thousands of points in them. And you don't want to have to resend all of that data, just to update a couple of values in the center uh, according to some change. And so you can use uh, dot .patch to do that. So I'll run another quick example. I'll run this one locally. So I'm going to run the OHLC example, which is, stands for open, high, low, close. So it's a particular kind of uh, chart uh, that's used a lot in finance. Uh, it shows the open. Uh, high, low, and close prices uh, sort of in real time for a stock ticker. In this case, this example is showing the, the candlesticks that show those four values. There's also uh, different kinds of moving average that's running through it. At the bottom, we've computed uh, some different kinds of indicators. Like they're called MACD or MACD9. I'm, I'm actually not a finance person. Um, but we have some widgets as well if you want to you know, make a lot of money. So this is synthetic data. So there's actually in the app itself, it's generating synthetic ticks. So if we want to make a lot of money, we can just raise the mean up and you know, give it a little, little bit. and. Uh, 
you know, it's going to go down first because there's some variance, but then it's going to sort of shoot up. And we can also raise the volatility here. We can in increase our standard deviation, and, and the model changes to, to re you know, reflect that. Maybe we want a different moving tick average. We want a 26-week uh, exponential moving average. So now it's computing that lagging average. And so this is this app. It's, you can run it locally. Again, you could, you could deploy it. It's using the streaming interface to be fairly efficient. Um, I used to ask people how many lines of code of Python they think they'd have to write to have both the simulation, the code that generates the layout and the widgets, the code that generates the plot, and to actually have it run. Uh, people always lowball me, so I'm not going to ask. But I'll tell you, it's under 100 lines of code uh, for all of that. right? And so I think that's a pretty good, pretty good ratio for sort of effort to, to what you get. OK. So that's, like I said, the, the streaming has been in there, I think, since 0 11 1, and patch was just put in very, very recently. Uh, some other things that are fairly new is we made Bokeh extensible. So one of the things I mentioned earlier about you know, having new contributors is that um, you know, we love to do it uh, at every sort of level of you know, contributions. We want to make it as easy as possible. We want to you know, sort of lower the bar. Uh, so that people can contribute at all kinds of levels. And so getting into core Bokeh dev, you know, building both the JavaScript library and the, you know, getting all the Python running um, is not so bad now. Two and a half years ago, it was really bad. I think there are probably four people that could you know, build Bokeh from scratch. But now it's, it's pretty easy for anyone to get started. But it's still an investment in you know, building this JavaScript library um, and being able to use it. So we made Bokeh extensible. So you don't actually have to get into core dev to add new features to the library. So, what does that mean? That means those model objects I mentioned earlier, you can make your own. So you can provide a JavaScript implementation, which is typically just some glue code that sort of responds to property changes and then interacts with whatever JavaScript library you want to sort of wrap, uh, and then sort of can go the opposite direction as well. So there's a little bit of JavaScript code. The Python classes are actually very declarative. So we've implemented some, some fun uh, you know, things to be able to have these very declarative models that typically have no code at all. right? So this is saying, I want to create this new custom widget that has a, a string, uh, sort of a text box, that has uh, a, a range instance as well that's a, a subclass of a slider. Uh, and then once you do this, uh, you can just use it like a regular bokeh object. right? You can say, I want to create a slider. I want to create this custom slider. Uh, this custom widget, rather. And then I want to put those things in a column and a layout. And it works you know, naturally. So you can just go to. Uh, the documentation's here. Open that up. And I think this example is actually down here. It's just this little fancy slider that adds this special div that opens up, right? And so that's all it does. But the idea is that you can do lots of fancy things. Like, what else could you do besides this little silly slider? Well, uh, for one thing is, you know, you can wrap other sides. So this is the ion range slider. Uh, Sarah actually, in a recent uh, client engagement, actually did exactly that. So our built-in slider is just a little JQ slider. It's nothing fancy, uh, but sometimes people want more fancy sliders. And so she wrote a custom extension that wrapped the ion slider. Looks really fantastic. Like I said, there's no one better at making Bokeh look great uh, than Sarah. And so using this ion range slider was really good. Um, you could also adapt more sophisticated JavaScript libraries. So there's actually an example of uh, running you know, this little 3D library. So there's no 3D capability built into Bokeh. Uh, I don't know that there ever will be in the core library, but that's okay because we can wrap other libraries that do provide that kind of capability, and we can hook them up to these Python analytics with Bokeh Server, and all of that works fine. So this is a Bokeh Server application that's just sending some data. There's a very small amount of code written for this custom extension that actually just sort of basically translates the Bokeh data structure into this library's data structure, uh, and that causes it to update, and so all of this sort of works. And so you could imagine finding your own favorite 3D library, uh, making a custom extension to wrap it, and then now all of a sudden you have uh, the ability to sort of front end you know, all of that, again, PyData stack with whatever sort of custom JS library you want. Okay. Uh, another example uh, would be adding LaTeX labels. <laughs> so people have been asking for this for a very, very long time. This is probably one of the older feature requests that we haven't ever gotten around doing. Um, you know, partly because to actually have sort of LaTeX nice functional labels uh, requires some external JavaScript libraries, things like either MathTech or we're actually using something called KaTeX that I think the Khan Academy makes. Um, and so we don't want to add those to Bokeh.js all the time because they would really bloat the library. The library is already a bit large. We don't want to just make it really big. We don't want people to have to pay for that heavy you know, sort of dependency if they're not using it. And so by making this now as a custom model or custom extension example, uh, we can demonstrate that there's the capability to have these kind of labels without actually having to sort of uh, put it in the core library. And so we may yet someday make a nice LaTeX label that's built into the core library. For now, there's a really nice example that you could use or adapt to your own use uh, for adding any kind of sort of LaTeX labels. And so again, that's um, happy to sort of uh, show that off. That was uh, Luke Canavan, who's been t really tearing it up on, on completing some old uh, sort of longstanding feature requests that people have wanted as we close towards 1.0. He's been really doing an amazing job. And, and this is one of the features that he just recently added. So the main idea, though, underlying all of this extension is that you don't have to wait, right? The core 
dev team doesn't have to be the gating factor. Um, you know, I'm really grateful to be a continuum where I had the opportunity to work on open source projects basically and, and get paid for it. Uh, but our ability to do that is sort of you know, limited by a lot of things and, and, and you know, our ability to sort of do business, to, to invest back into open source. And so you know, would that we had unlimited resources, I'd have a team of you know, 20 people working on Bokeh. That'd be awesome. But uh, absent that, I want to try to lower the bar so people can make their own contributions and their own uh, innovations and their own extensions to Bokeh uh, and not have to wait on us. Right? Um, that's more valuable for everyone. OK, so putting it all together, showing one last sort of example app uh, that has some custom extensions, that has the streaming API, uh, that uses some layout. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look. This is one of my um, apps that I've sort of been coming back to over the years. Uh, and I'll tell you why in a second. So this is the spectrogram demo. Um, let's see if that comes up. Well, didn't like me. Live demos. I think I need. Oh. It doesn't like me. I'll have to come back to it. Um, try one more thing. There we go. Sorry about that. I had the wrong branch checked out in my repo. So it's, all, it's actually an important note. So sometimes people uh, file bug reports because they go to run examples on master and they might have an old version of Bokeh installed. We're definitely narrowing down on our API sort of uh, surface and making it uh, more and more um, you know, backwards compatible. And actually, these days, we're, we're quite conscientious about that. But certainly, if you're running uh, some of the newer examples that have new features and you've got an old version of Bokeh, it's not going to work. So if, you're, if you do have an older version of Bokeh, you always want to try to make sure to look at the appropriate tag in GitHub to look at those examples. So what does this example do that I'm running? So again, this uses the streaming thing. There's a custom model that helps with some of the streaming for the, the image. But this is a live audio spectrogram. So it's actually reading my microphone. It's doing a Fourier transform. It's doing the computation of the power spectrum there. Got a fun little radial sort of graphic equalizer there off to the side. Um, you know, we can do things like, you know, up the gain, or actually we can change the frequency if we really want to sort of focus down on the, you know, the speech, you know, the range of human speech is a little bit lower uh, in frequency. Um, and it's fun, you know, I see if I can find my tone generator. So Peter Wang once embarrassed me at a Pi Data, so I was showing off an older, older version of this, and he's like, you should whistle into it. And I was like, thank you, Peter, you've just shown everyone that I don't know how to whistle. So, <laughs> uh, but you know, it's nice because, hopefully this isn't too loud, you know, we can see the nice spike uh, right where that frequency is, right? And so if we were to change the, you know, the, uh, the range here, sort of see. So anyway, that's a nice example. The reason that I like to show this off, or the reason I have been showing it off for sort of quite some time, um, is because there was an original version of this that actually used Bokeh.js directly. And it was a fun sort of toy demonstration. Um, I mean, it was nice. to show it off at SciPy. It was great. It was about 600 lines of coffee script, right? So although it was kind of cool to look at, no one wants to write that. Um, about a year ago, uh, due to some work and advancements in Bokeh, I was able to show off another version of it that was a lot more Python and had a little bit of you know, sort of coffee script. It was about 100 and 120 lines, maybe. Still not so great. The ultimate goal, what I've wanted to get to and why I'm showing this off maybe for the last time, is that now this is pretty much pure Python. As I mentioned, there's an extension model in here that has maybe 15 lines of JavaScript. Uh, beyond that, this is a pure Python app. And this is in the repo. You can go check it out. Um, it uses some rather sophisticated techniques, uh, having sort of a separate thread for computing all of this and being able to update the, you know, the, the viewed application from that thread. There's documentation on that in the user's guide. But um, that's sort of the, the ultimate. Like That's the goal we've been trying to get to for sort of two years. And this sort of represents that, you know, that success. And so I'm really happy. Um, to be able to show that off. OK. So, so that's a fun spectrogram. And, and for the audio detectives, if you're curious where that particular image came from, it was a postponer jukebox. So I just played it off my phone. Um, OK. Another thing to mention about Bokeh, uh, which I guess I've already given this away, spoiler, uh, is that it's not just for Python, right? Um, we have the JavaScript functional API. But as I mentioned, anything that can generate the right JSON can drive Bokeh uh, documents, Bokeh okay, browser. So um, one of our collaborators from the XData initiative, uh, Ryan Hafen, he's, he's not with Continuum. He's just one of our collaborators on that, that, uh, you know, that uh, contract. And he's a big R person. And so he really liked Bokeh. But of course, he wanted to use it from R. And so he wrote an R binding for Bokeh, R Bokeh. And so you can go to uh, hafen.github.io slash R Bokeh. And he has a lot of really great examples of Bokeh plots 
you know, that have nice styling. He sort of changed the styling to things that he likes. Uh, but you can see it's our code that generates that, right? So there's this one with regression lines, and all of them have the standard tools that you would want. You know, here's my resize tool. All of that's great. Um, I love this funny little periodic table with the, the hover tool on it. Uh, again, generated from not much R code up here. A lot of other stuff. Anyway, so you can go and sort of see what he's done. And that's not the only one. There's actually uh, Bokeh Scala. So one of our other core contributors, Mateusz Poproszki, uh, he's heavily involved in working on the, you know, the Bokeh JS core internals. And he's been helping clean that up and tighten things up for, for a long time. And, but he's also, uh, you know, he's a big Scala fan. And so he wrote Bokeh Scala. Uh, I'd love to see even more language bindings for Bokeh. There is a currently unmaintained Bokeh Julia. I think it last was updated for Bokeh 0.4, which has been several, a couple of years now. If there are any Julia fans in here, uh, anyone interested in a new project, uh, sort of updating you know, Bokeh.Julia for the current you know, releases of Bokeh, I think would be a tremendous and a fantastic thing for, uh, for the Julia community. I think it would offer a lot of capability um, and, and be really well received. But again, if I, don't, I don't know Julia, so I'm not the right person to do that. But OK. Uh, last but not least, a few things to talk about. Uh, what if you have large data sets? We always wanted to have some capability around large data sets for Bokeh. Um, there was originally some work called abstract rendering. It came out of some academic papers. We had some collaborators, again, part of that XData initiative, uh, Joseph Cottom. Um, so what do you have when you have billions and billions of points? Well, you have billions and billions of problems for large data sets. And what are some of those problems, right? So obviously, you know, overplotting. If you have a lot of points and you plot them and you don't have any kind of alpha compositing, it, the order that you plot them matters, right? You're sort of deceiving yourself. I mean, the problems are not about even the number of points, really. The problems are about sort of visual uh, you know, accurate visual representations of your data. Overplotting is one problem. You know, you can try to say, okay, I'm going to apply an alpha value to my data, um, but that doesn't necessarily get you far, right? Saturation happens as well. You know, if you set your alpha value to 0 0.1, as soon as 10 circles line up on one pixel, that's as you've completely blown your dynamic threshold, right? You, you, you know, it doesn't matter whether you have 10 or 20 or 30, it's going to look the same, and so you've saturated. So you say, well, I'll lower my alpha more, I'll make my circles smaller, uh, but I don't know, I can't really <laughs> much from those. So that's, then undersaturation becomes a problem. Or if your data has a lot of different areas of differing density, then you might have one area that's really undersaturated where another area is still completely oversaturated. And so these are the kind of problems you want to deal with. Um, if you've got these problems, you might say you want to resort to binning. But at a certain point, you're really binning sort of at the pixel level. I mean, it, the problem is this is a really hard parameter to pick. I mean, you get lots of different results based on the binning size that you pick. And it's hard to tune this parameter automatic or to just, you know, to tune it. And so what can we do? And so we have a separate project called Data Shader that came out of this abstract rendering idea. Um, it's under the Bokeh organization on GitHub. It's also BSD licensed. It's really a pipeline for automatic rendering of large data sets. And it does that by rasterizing the data in Python. So it uses things like Numba and Dask for performance reasons. Um, and it can aggregate, can do sort of pre-rendering, a pre-rasterization rather of the data um, that generates these aggregates that are you know, roughly of the size of the screen. So you're not trying to send a billion points into your browser, because that, that would be a pretty bad day for your browser. Um, but the thing is that these aggregates still can have lots of useful, interesting computations and, and queries done on them. But the idea is it solves these problems of overplotting, underplotting, and saturation. Um, and it mitigates the binning problem because it gives you um, interactive, uh, interactive capabilities. When it's combined with Bokeh, it gives you interactive capabilities across a wide scale. I'll see some examples here in a minute. Uh, another thing that's nice is that statistical transformations are a first class part of the, the visualization of the pipeline. So it, again, on these aggregates, you can ask really interesting questions. You know, so I'm about to show some census examples. Um, it's sort of, uh, 350 million points uh, uh, tagged by uh, racial self-identification. And you can ask questions like, for a particular pixel uh, that you're going to show, uh, show me you know, pixels where there's at least one representative of, of every racial category. Or show me uh, pixels where you know, one particular category is more than another category. And those operations are very fast, because they operate on the aggregates. Uh, and it's pretty cool. So let me go ahead and get to that. Oh yeah, as I mentioned, it's an independent project under the Bokeh GitHub organization. Uh, OK, so let's maybe take a quick look at a couple, see if these are still running. It's my live demo. So there's a lot of notebooks. So Jim Bednar, who heads up the data shader uh, effort, he writes really fantastic, um, very narrative notebooks. Uh, you know, sort of explain things. This is actually one of the tutorial notebooks. So this is actually, this is a pretty small data set. This is a million points. Like this sort of explains the data shader pipeline as well. I'm not going to go into that detail. But this is a million points, uh, or maybe it's 4 million. I think it's uh, four Gaussians. And you can sort of see, if you just plot it, you, know, you can't really see a lot of detail because we've sent a bunch of points to the browser there. Um, it goes through a lot of the different transformations you can get to. And, and if you're interested in data shader, I recommend you look at it. What I want to get to, though, is the very end where it sort of, again, it integrates very nicely with Bokeh. So here's all you know, million of those points, or I guess it might actually be 4 million. What you can do is you can zoom in. 
and you get progressive refinement across that, right? So I can look into this particular sort of you know, tightly coupled uh, value here where I start to get to areas of individual points, right? So that's happening you know, on this laptop right now as I do it. And so that's, again, that's a pretty small data set. I've done this with 10 million points where I have a lot of things running, so I didn't try to bump that up a bit further. Uh, in particular, I have the census example running, which has 350 million points, right? So this read in the 350 million points. It generated some aggregates from that data. Again, this is census data tagged by uh, self-identification. And again, we can sort of zoom in. So at the, at the outermost level here, we get these sort of techniques like equal, uh, histogram equalization that tries to help with this dynamic range problem that helps to try to solve this uh, undersaturation, oversaturation problem. So we can still see uh, detail where the data is not as dense, and we don't get completely blown away where the data is more dense. Uh, but also, we can also zoom in, right, when we couple this with bokeh. So if I want to zoom in to, say, New York here, let's zoom in pretty far. Take just a second to go ahead and update that because it is a little bit bigger. So we start to see a lot more structure around New York, right? And so I can keep zooming in and get down eventually to the, to the level of individual measurements, right? These have all been anonymized of the block level, by the way. This is the census synthetic data. Uh, and so you can sort of see there's a lot of structure in New York, but you know, it looks pretty you know, homogeneous in some areas, but then again, you can sort of zoom in a lot further and you can start to see there's more structure and more differences you know, at the individual lock, block level. So it's very good for sort of diving down. Uh, last example here I want to show is New York City taxi data. This has got some fun stuff. Uh, this is that sort of idea of being able to do visual queries. Here I've got the 12 million point taxi set data, and I can ask questions. I can say, where drop-offs are more than pickups in a particular pixel? I want to color that dark blue. Where the pickups are greater, I want to color that red. And you can see immediately the structure sort of of New York of the sort of the main thoroughfares of Manhattan show up. There's obviously more pickups along the main thoroughfares that run north-south-ish, and there's more drop-offs on these cross streets. And so that's great. But you know, from that, you might say, well, let's extrapolate. Let's talk about other cities where we don't know what the physical structure of the city is. How can we identify those major thoroughfares? Um, and you can look over and, and see, well, obviously, the, the areas where there are more pickups might be those major thoroughfares. And again, uh, combined with Bokeh, we can sort of zoom in and sort of see the individual levels. I love showing off this New York data set, uh, especially because there's this funny little area. Or is it it's right here, I think? Does anyone know what this is? Right here on the west, uh, west coast of Manhattan. What's that? That's the Javits Center, right? So it's got this really funny structure. There's like a little sort of circular shaped you know, parking lot, big parking lot in front, of, uh, in front of the Javits Convention Center. And so of course the cabs come in and they drop people off and then immediately they pick people up and then they head off, right? So you can sort of see that weird structure there. Um, so that's cool. So there's one, what else? There's a lot of examples. I'd recommend checking out all of these notebooks. There's some scripts that'll download the data for you, uh, all kinds of good stuff. Anyway, that's kind of running pretty close to time. So I'm gonna keep keep moving on. But anyway, so that's, that's Data Shader. Data Shader's fantastic. Again, it's a separate project, but it's under the GitHub organization. So I encourage you to check it out. There's definitely some uh, webinars that have been made. You can go see the video, Jim talking in, in great detail, and Peter as well, about how Data Shader works and some other uh, concrete examples as well. So sorry, I went back there. Um, I mentioned that you know, Data Shader uses Dask. I just want to mention this quickly. So Dask is another open source project that sort of continuum got started. Matt Rockland's the lead developer for it. Uh, it's a Python library for uh, parallel distributed computing. If you're reaching for something like PySpark, but you want something that's more Pythonic, Dask might be a good choice for you, right? So it's very Pythonic, right? It keep, keeps you in sort of pandas-like, NumPy-like expressions, and it doesn't have this sort of Java-like API shoehorned into Python. Um, but what's really nice about it is Matt has written a really amazing bokeh application, one of the most sophisticated ones, for cluster monitoring uh, for these distributed tasks. Um, let's see if we can go ahead and start this video. Nope. OK, there we go. Don't actually want audio there. But so this is a, you know, this, this, uh, this is actually monitoring the entire cluster, right? So there's various, uh, you know, bars represent whether there's processes on the cluster are waiting, whether they're reading data, whether they're doing computation, whether they're transferring data back to, you know, the, the, some, you know, gather kind of operation. And so this is like in real time. And so this is really fantastic, I think, uh, you know, application. It's one of, like I said, more, more sophisticated ones that I've seen. Uh, and it's a great thing to come out of Dask. A few folks have said things about Dask, like it's invaluable for understanding and optimizing distributed computing performance. And I think Matt himself said about Bokeh that the nice thing about it is that he didn't need to you know, sort of reach out to a web developer. This is something he wrote himself. And he's able to write this sort of very uh, sophisticated web application for monitoring and cluster performance uh, in pure Python, right? So that's, that's sort of the idea. Again, doing more with less. That sort of comes back to that theme of what we want to enable people to do. OK, so in I think the time remaining, I think I have about five minutes. Quickly want to go over uh, sort of what's upcoming uh, in Bokeh, sort of what's uh, on the horizon, or sometimes actually has already been merged, but not in a release yet. So the first thing is to have more arbitrary computed columns. And by this, I mean um, we want to be able to compute things on the client side, 
So another uh, new contributor added a really fantastic, really involved PR for what we call computed transforms. And basically this means things like a uh, jitter transform. Like if you want to show some data and you want to jitter it, before you'd have to actually apply that jitter in Python and then send the jitter data to JavaScript. Now you're able to say, hey, I want to send the original data column and I want it to transform according to this jitter transformation. And that's actually really nice for a lot of reasons. Uh, we want to add more of those transformations, and some of them have already gone in. Sarah Bird just added a color mapper transform, so now uh, what you have to do currently would be able to create a bunch of uh, a column full of colors if you wanted to have you know, a bunch of circles with different colors. Now you can send some data and a color mapper and say map according to this, and the color mapping is actually done on the browser. That's really fantastic. We're going to add a custom JS uh, transform as well, so you can do basically any kind of arbitrary transformation uh, you know, on, the, on the client. So if you wanted to have a bubble chart, again, you could send some original data and modulate the size based on that transform. So that's I'm really excited about that. that. That actually just went in master, I think, yesterday. Um, another thing that's a long-standing issue that we're they're working on um, is SVG output. Um, this is just a really hard technical problem that doesn't have a lot of, well, it has some various solutions that aren't all good. Um, our current best option for this seems to be Chrome Headless. Uh, Chrome Headless is pretty new. It has some promising results. It's really difficult to build, so we're going to have to maybe provide some upstream help with packaging and making it easy to install Chrome Headless. Right now, Chrome Headless is also only really available on Linux, so we'll have to see if we can help get Windows or other builds available, but um, that's, that's the plan, and we want to have that for a 1.0 release. Um, but again, it's just kind of one of the technically challenging problem, and we're, we're slowly but surely making pro uh, progress. Another thing on the horizon is NumFocus fiscal sponsorship. So NumFocus is a 403C uh, nonprofit organization. It was started by the other co-founder of uh, Continuum, Travis Oliphant, who's the author of NumPy. Uh, it's really, uh, the idea is to be able to share the bureaucratic load. So, you know, to make it easier for projects to be able to accept donations or uh, grants from outside and not have to deal with like all the tax implications, right? So NumFocus takes care of all of that for all of the sponsored projects, uh, makes it very simple. Uh, if there's needs for like marketing or sometimes funds for developer meetings, NumFocus can provide that as well. Uh, so we're headed towards a NumFocus fiscal sponsorship, hopefully uh, in early 2017. Color bars, I don't know if I want to brag about this too much, probably something we should have had two years ago. Uh, this was just merged as well, finally, at long last. Um, so we've been waiting on layout capability. That's honestly the reason why it's, I mean, it's not hard to write a color bar, right? But we wanted to be able to have color bars in the, in the plot region and outside and wherever and, and with nice arbitrary sort of ticks. And so, you know, we could have sort of written some throwaway code a long time ago, and, and, but we just sort of bandwidth limited as a team. So we didn't want to write that throwaway code. We just waited until we had this nice layout capability that Sarah added. Uh, and now we have color bars. So that's going to be in the next 012 release as well. Um, what else? Uh, I'd love to have a community uh, repository or mechanism for sharing those extensions, right? So I mentioned, you know, it's easy for anyone to create a bokeh extension, but what if they're easily installable, easily shareable? Think, you know, the Atom plugin editor, right? Um, if I, you know, if we can make it so that anyone's extension is easily installable by anyone else, I think that magnifies the value of those extensions uh, dramatically across the entire community. Again, it's all about sort of lowering the bar for uh, engagement and for uh, you know getting involved, and so that's that's really my vision for that. I'd like that to be in a you know a bokeh, uh, ex a bokeh ext command or something that brings up a a nice uh, extension installer. Uh, I'd like that to be in the 1.0 as well. Another thing is bokeh develop mode. Um, right now, uh, you run your uh, bokeh serve on the app, and it sort of uh, it sort of just uh, you know stays there. We'd like this is a prototype that never got merged. We're going to circle back and make it work where. You know, you've got the code over here, and the code looks a little bit different because, again, this was a little bit older. But the idea is that you know, it automatically reloads, basically. If you, if you change something uh, over there, then the plot automatically updates. So there it changed the circles to red, and maybe we want to change the, the size there to 50, and all of a sudden it automatically, again, updates. Uh, going along with this, we also want to add some capability for adding uh, editing on the plot itself, right? So being able to click on different elements of the plot and having little editors show up. Um, another thing is binary protocol for arrays. So, this is really exciting to me because I think Bokeh does a pretty good job already. Right now, it just JSONs all the things. But surprisingly, uh, for a lot of the examples I showed you with the streaming data, or uh, even when it's sending all of the data, it's still quite performant. Like that, uh, the sliders example was very fast, right? But it's sending all the data. And so uh, we have put in the basic plumbing for multi-segment uh, messages over our protocol. So we use a WebSocket for sending the data. Uh, we have the support for that. We just need to go in and actually make the, you know, the encoding of arrays be specialized to be you know, uh, binary, right? Instead of doing the conversion to JSON and back, we would just send the, the bytes uh, and put them directly into type three views in the client. And I think that's going to be a really nice performance increase for Bokeh. But the nice thing is, is we're already in a good place. And so the fact that we're already in a good place and still have this uh, low-hanging fruit, I think, is, is you know, I, I don't know. I'm really happy about that. Um, Let's see, JupyterLab integrations. Who's familiar with JupyterLab? 
great. There's a lot of folks in here who aren't, who are going to be really happy, I think, in the near future. So Jupyter Lab is basically the next generation, next iteration of, I don't want to say the notebook. It's really more of like an RStudio. It's more like an IDE uh, in the browser, right? So you know, the notebook has this sort of traditional sort of ma Mathematica style kind of you know, input, output, input, output, input, output. And that's sort of really great for a lot of you know, data science and exploratory data analysis workflows. And that's great. That's not what I am. I'm a tinker. I'm not a data scientist. And so I don't actually use the notebook much. But Jupyter Lab allows you to define your workspace however you want, with maybe an editor over here or a notebook over here if you want the classic sort of notebook, uh, but maybe a fixed output area over to the side where plots could go uh, instead of having them interleaved in between your input and output. Uh, and so I'm really excited. So this is being developed as a collaboration between the Jupyter core team, uh, some folks from Continuum, and also uh, Bloomberg. And so uh, it's really, really exciting. There, there it's, you can check it out now. It's not quite ready for you know, sort of uh, prime time, but you can already check it out and take a look at it. It's really exciting. And so we're going to make sure that Bokeh integrates with that really, really well. And then last but not least, like I said, we're headed towards a 1.0 release. I'm hoping in the next two to three months. The absolute main focus of our 1.0 release um, you know, there's some of these features that we want to get in. There's some bug fixes we need to make. We certainly won't get to all of the bug fixes before 1.0. But the main thing um, is uh, stability and API stability in particular. And, and right now, we have some folks working on being able to automatically crawl our API and, and generate nice reports and, and tell us what's changed and what's different uh, with the intention, and I uh, shouldn't say intention, absolute you know, guarantee that at 1.0, we're going to move forward with strict semantic versioning. So you know, we won't be having any API breakages. Now, as part of this, we may actually move a little few things out of the core library. So bokeh.charts, this high-level API, uh, we might actually move that to a separate project. So it can depend on Pandas, really, as, as a package. Um, but again, all of that's contingent on making the core of Bokeh very, very stable, uh, a stable platform for people to build libraries around. And that's really what I'd like to see going into the next year, is to be able to have people build, uh, you know, build libraries around Bokeh that use it, that do even more amazing things based on top of it, that uh, you know, build extensions, right? To be able to build extensions and have them still work you know, five months later, requires things to be stable. And so that's really the main focus of 1.0, is just to be able to uh, augment our build and our tests and our you know, automation to be able to support that kind of uh, guarantee. And it's really uh, exciting work, I know, <laughs> working, in the, working in the trenches of Travis CI and Sauce Labs. But anyway, that's, that's the main goal. So um, anyway, last few things. Um, if you download the slides, there's a link here to a bunch of resources. Obviously, everything's you know, a lot of stuff on GitHub. Our documentation page is there. Those example apps. Um, there's some great tutorial notebooks that have, have grown up over the last uh, uh, you know, year or so. We had a few, and now I think we have about 12. Um, the mailing list is a really great place to engage with us and with other users, uh, ask a lot of questions. Um, and then finally, we have a Gitter chat room as well that we, you know, we monitor as best we can. Um, and, you know, the, the bandwidth is a real problem, as Raymond said this morning. So it's, I'm really, great, uh, really happy, rather, to see a lot of users sort of stepping up and answering questions on their own. Uh, that's good. So finally, call to action. Install it, check it out. Um, it's on github.com. You know, if it's appropriate, you can certainly uh, engage with us, right? So we do you know, client work around Bokeh, and this, this helps drive features in Bokeh. This helps drive bug fixes in Bokeh. This helps support the project going forward. Um, this kind of feedback is extremely valuable. So if that makes sense, certainly, um, you know, you can consider that as well. OK, um, finally, that's it. So I'd take, love to take questions. <laughs> All right, we have uh, five minutes for questions. Anyone? Do you have anything for network graphs like Sigma JS or? Ah, yeah. So the question's about network graphs. So um, there's one example in that shows uh, using Network X to, to show some interesting things. So here's the status of that. Right now, you can draw whatever you want with Bokeh. So if you lay things out on the Python side, you can have it draw whatever you want. What's missing um, is sort of dynamic layout in the JavaScript side. So if you wanted to send the graph data as like nodes and edges, and then have something on the JavaScript side lay that out, or maybe change that layout. That's what's not there now. You could write a custom extension to do that. You could wrap, for instance, the D3 network library to do all the graph layout and actually plug that into Bokeh. I think that'd be a great demonstration. And you could do that without getting involved in core development. So there are some examples that do the, like the layout on the Python side and show a network. And you can have all kinds of tools and selections. And you, know, you can do hit testing and all that sort of thing. Uh, but you can't change that layout really very easily. So that's, that's what we're at right now. Yep. Uh, I got another question. Uh, would it be possible to integrate this with uh, other third-party chart tools, such as uh, you know, D3.js or HiChar, if the project already uses them? Yeah, so um, I mean, I guess there's maybe two answers. The question is about integrating with other charts. So I wouldn't say there's much direct integration. You can certainly, you know, if, if what you want is to connect D3 to the PyData stack, you can write custom extensions to do that. If what you want is to connect high charts to the PyData stack in a Bokeh application, you can do that as well. Um, beyond that, I would say you know, they won't get 
any, in their, each other's way, right? You can certainly use them together. Uh, they won't interfere with one another, but there's no sort of direct integration, especially at the JavaScript level. At the Python level, there is some level of compatibility. We have a incomplete uh, and partial matplotlib compatibility layer. It uses um, Jake Vanderplas's MPL exporter library. Um, and it provides sort of a partial level of matplotlib compatibility, and, and so you can sort of get some partial seaborn and ggplot.py compatibility as well, but it's not complete uh, by any stretch. Um, someday we might get MEP25 implemented by the, the matplotlib team, and that'll let us have much tighter integration with mat, mat, uh, matplotlib, but um, so yeah, I don't know if that answers the question, but I, I would say that there's not any direct integration, but you, you, could certainly, you could certainly drive D3 from you know, a bunch of pandas and scikit-learn you know, code uh, through the Bokeh server very easily if you wanted to. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you. Yeah, thank you.